What we like to do here at our church is we walk through books of the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, so we can understand the context and understand the meaning of the text. And then what we want to do is then ask the Holy Spirit to apply that to our lives and show us how the whole thing connects to Jesus. We've been singing uh, to Jesus, about Jesus. Everything in the Bible points to Christ. And so uh, what we'd like to do is just work through these things slowly and uh, get there and see where the Lord is lifted up. The, the challenge is that sometimes you guys forget what I preach week to week. <laughs> And of course, sometimes we have guests and you're not kind of a part of that week to week uh, going through the text. And so you don't know quite where we are. And last week we had a Resurrection Sunday, also known as Easter to many of you. And so we took a little pause. So let me just quickly catch you up to speed about 2 Samuel. So we know, of course, that God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. And at the end of all of his creation, including Adam and Eve, he said it is good. In fact, it is very good. And he gave a command. He said, you cannot eat from the tree of what? Okay, there's this tree, and it will give you this, this knowledge of good and evil. You're not supposed to uh, take this fruit, but what's interesting is, do they obey that? No. No. Eve takes, she eats, gives her husband who was with her, and they eat, and that is, the, that is the first sin that we see committed. We've been seeing about mercy all morning. Well, we need mercy because of sin. And so that introduces sin into the world and death, spiritual death and physical death. And in Genesis 3, God promises that He's going to send someone who's going to fix this whole problem. He's going to send someone who's going to come from the, the seed of Eve who's going to fix the problem. And what you end up seeing is that this, this, this idea goes throughout the whole Old Testament, tracing this one who's going to come. Many of you are familiar with the Father Abraham. He had many sons. And many sons... That father... Yeah, I'm not going to sing it, you know. That's why Tom gets us up here. But Abraham's another one that comes along, and God chooses him. And he's, and he's worshiping other gods, and God chooses him. He says, you know what? You're going to go to the land that I'm going to show you. And from you, even though you don't have kids yet, from your line, I'm going to bless all the nations. I'm going to bless you so that you will in turn be a blessing to all the nations. And the way you're going to be a blessing to all the nations is someone from your line, your seed, is going to come. And he will bless all the nations. So you kind of see this kind of idea of the seed going through and so what we, we then see is Abraham has a son Isaac, Isaac has a son Jacob, Jacob has 12 sons, and his name is changed to Israel. Israel. You have the 12 tribes of Israel. So maybe you've heard of Israel before, the 12 tribes of Israel. And more promises are made, like to Judah, saying that there's going to be one, Judah, one of those sons, that the, uh, from your seat there's going to be a king who sits on a throne. Okay, so now we're getting more clear on who this person is. And so as this nation of Israel now exists, they, they, they have some challenges. They go into Egypt for a while, and they become slaves. And then God raised up Moses, and that's what Tom was talking about in the book of Exodus, and he leads them out of Egypt. And they go through the Red Sea where God does this miracle and parts the Red Sea, and they travel around in the wilderness for a while. They don't get to go straight to the promised land because many of the people of Israel are like most of you, a little bit stubborn. I mean, like me too, but mostly like you guys. <laughs> don't, don't, they don't listen well, they, they complain back and forth all the time, but the Lord still promises that He's going to save His people. And so as they're, they're wandering around, Moses ends up dying, and then Joshua's raised up, and he takes them into the promised land. And they're supposed to, to, to wipe out all of the enemies that are there, and they're supposed to settle on the land. And, and they, they kind of do that. They don't obey all the way, which again is like many of you, and sometimes me, but mostly you. But we don't obey God all the way. And so they go in, and, and, and as they're there, they're saying, well, we, we need some type of structure here. And so God raised up judges, and judges kind of lead God's people. Now, he's the, he's the king, but, he, but the judges lead God's people. And after a while, these judges, what, what happens if you're familiar with the book of Judges is there's just a cycle that goes through over and over and over again. And in this cycle, uh, God's people, they, they say, we're going to follow you, God. We love you. We're going to listen all the way. And then they don't. They sin. And then God raises up other nations to come in and, and, and cause issues. And that's God's discipline upon them. They cry out to God, God, please help. He raises up a judge. And the judge delivers them. And that's the cycle through judges. And that takes us to 1 Samuel. That's where Israel's at. They're, they're, they're in the land. They don't really have the land completely because they didn't obey God. They have these judges and Samuel steps on the scene, and he's, the, he's the, the, the last judge. And he's also going to be the, the priest. And he, he's a, a prophet as well. 
And what he says is, okay, listen up. I mean, God, the Lord knows your heart here. And you're crying out all the time that you don't want just judges. You want to look like the rest of the nations. You want a king. They say, we want a king so we look like everybody else. They're not supposed to do that. They're supposed to be separate from everyone else, Christians. But we at times want to look like everyone around us. So he says, all right, you're going to get a king. And he raised up a king that they wanted. Now this first guy named Saul, was he a good king? No, he was not a king who was truly from God's own heart or after God's own heart. And so the book of 1 Samuel, as we walk through, was talking about this kind of this, this transition from the judges to the kings and Samuel's role. And this guy Saul, and how he was the king. And, and then the Lord took the kingdom from this guy named Saul, and he gave it first privately to another guy, to the next king. And what was his name, congregation? David. David. And we're all like, oh, David's so sweet and great, never does anything wrong. <laughs> Uh, he does, he does some things wrong. But as we see the transition happening, 1 Samuel ends and we see that Saul dies. And the kingdom isn't fully yet David's. And then we started 2 Samuel and we saw that, yeah, well, uh, he became the, the king of, of Judah, one of those 12 tribes. But it hadn't really gone out to the, the rest of Israel yet. Because the moment that he was anointed, or actually just shortly after he was anointed, a commander of Saul's army who had died, he steps in, and instead of just, just following David as he should have done, he goes ahead and he, he appoints a king over Israel. He says, well, this is actually going to be the king. Ishbosheth. Hard to say. He's going to be the king. And so now you have kind of two kingdoms going on inside Israel. And what we saw then was that even though David was anointed the king there, and Ishbosheth the king of Israel, there's a battle between the two. And we see that different guys are being killed and generals, and it's kind of a, a mess going on. But what's happening overall that you need to see is God is moving. He's taking power away from Saul's kingdom. Even though Saul's gone, he's still stripping that away, and he's giving it to David. Because he said the kingdom's going to David. God is working that out. And even by chapter 3, a couple weeks ago when we were in there, this, this general who at first had appointed this other king of Israel... He actually comes over to David and is kind of like, hey, let's make a covenant and I'll help you have the whole kingdom. Well, that guy ended up getting killed. David wanted to, to have that agreement, that covenant, but some of David's men, if you'll remember, killed him. And we saw that David mourned Saul's death. He mourned the death of this general. Because he was a godly man who wanted what's best for God's kingdom. He wanted his people, God's people, to be united. And so now we have this general's dead, but this other king, Saul's son, is on the throne still, Ishbosheth. And David's also king. And that's where chapter 4 picks up. So if you haven't been here, then that gets you up to speed on where we are. Let's work through the text together and see what it means and how does it apply and how does it connect to Jesus. 2 Samuel chapter 4. When Ishbosheth, Saul's son, that's the other king, heard that Abner, the general, had died at Hebron, his courage failed, and all Israel was dismayed. See, it was really, let me just put, make it over here. It was really Abner, that general, that was the strong one, that was holding the, the, the kingdom of Israel on this side together. And so now that he's dead, the, the text says courage failed, but it really is this, his arms fell limp. And the, and the author is showing us again, Saul's kingdom is getting weak. Getting weak. Verse 2, now Saul's son had two men who were captains of raiding bands. The name of one was Benah, and the name of the other was Rechab. Sons of Renan, a man of Benjamin from Beroth. For Beroth was, is also counted part of Benjamin. That gets into a little bit of history there of Israel. But it is to say this, that these, these two brothers who are the, the son of this man here, they're from the same tribe as Saul. So the king over here, who's now kind of this like discouraged uh, king, he has these two guys that are kind of working for him as they should be, and we're going to see something happen. Verse 3 says, The Berethites fled to Gittim and have been sojourners there to this day. It's talking about those people that these two men came from. This, a, a small group that they were a part of that Saul actually mistreated. Saul mistreated these guys, these two guys who've been working for the king. 
And now the, the strong general is gone, and now you have a weak king. And these two guys, here's what they're going to do. They're going to say, opportunity. There's weakness, and there's opportunity. Now let's see what happens. Verse 4. Jonathan, the son of Saul, this was, for those who don't know, don't know one of uh, Saul's other sons, and David's best friend, Jonathan, who had already died. Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, uh, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mithbalotheth. <laughs> and so now you have, you have the, the, the king who's there, and he's kind of weak. The general who's strong is gone. You have David on this side who's strong. And the only other possibility of somebody who could be the king and challenge David overall is lame. He couldn't even be the king. It's showing again the weakness of Saul's kingdom now. Now, verse 5. The sons of Rimmon, the, the two guys that we were talking about before, the Burethite and Rechab and Benah set out, and about the heat of the day, they came to the house of Ishbosheth. And he was taking a noonday rest. The king was resting in his, in his home, in his bed, in about the middle of the day. Okay? They're coming in. Now these guys work for him, so there shouldn't be a problem. They're going in to get grain or something. And they came into the midst of the house as if, it, as if to get wheat. And they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and Banah, his brother, escaped. So they go in and they stab the king. Notice that idea of stabbing in the stomach again. We've seen that over and over again. And now we're going to get more details on the, what just happened here. Verse 7. When they came into the house, as he lay on his bed, in his bedroom, they struck him and put him to death and then beheaded him. Then they took his head and went by the way of the Araba all night, which would be the, the desert. They traveled all night with his head. Now, real quick pause here. There's a reason we didn't do this text over Easter last Sunday. <laughs> Even though it's God's word and it's all helpful, and I do think that this ties to Jesus, I'm not sure many of you would have been uplifted that Sunday by this text. Because there's more. Watch this. They brought the head, verse 8, of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron. And they said to the king, watch this, look what they do. Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my lord the king this day on Saul and on his offspring. They said, we're going to get good with David. This was the king of the other kingdom, Saul's son. Saul kept trying to kill you. Everybody knows that. So we cut off his head and we've come to deliver it to you. Oh. Apparently they didn't, they didn't know about chapter 1 of 2 Samuel that we covered, did they? Those of you who were not with us, you go back and read about that. There was somebody else who came and said that he helped Saul die, David's enemy. And... Uh, David took care of him real quick. said, who do you think you are to touch God's anointed king? Even though Saul had been trying to kill David, David respected God enough to say, God is the one who's in control and will do things. And so that didn't go well for that guy. He was killed. Let's see what happens to these guys. But David answered Rehab and Benah, his brother, the sons of Ramanite, the Burethite, as the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. When one told me, behold, Saul is dead, I, he, and thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and killed him at Ziklag, which was the reward I gave him for his news. How much more when wicked men have killed a righteous man in his own house on his bed, shall I now not require his blood at your hand and destroy you from the earth? And David commanded his young men, and they killed them and cut off their hands and feet and hanged them beside the pool of Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried in the tomb of Abner, Hebron. Tough Easter message. <laughs> Tough message anyway. What is going on? What is going on? These guys think, all right, the general, the tough guy, the one really leading, he's gone now. So they go and they kill the king of this part of Israel in cold blood. They murder him. Cut off his head, bring it to David. David's like, yeah, that's not going to go well for you. So then he cuts off hands, feet, and hangs them on the tree. How does this help us? <laughs> what can we see? I've got a few things for you today. Number one. Notice 
that when they come to David, they come bringing news. They think that they're doing something that's going to be helpful. But their motives are all about just trying to get in good with the king. They want to be thought well of by the king. They want to have blessing. They want to have power. They want to have honor. So let me start with this. What do people do or what will people do to get power? Honor. Respect of others. Let me go a little deeper. What will you do? What things do you do? Where do you compromise? Where do you go against God's word? Just so you can be thought well of by others. So you could be uh, liked by everybody, perhaps, like these guys. And when they did it, it's not like they just come. They also come, they came and they kind of covered it with righteous language. Did you guys see that? Go back to verse 8. When they came to the king... They brought the head of Ishbosheth right, to David of Hebron. And they said, no, here's the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my Lord, the king, this day. They came. And, and so that's the thing you all need to understand. Is a lot of times when people will come and they're doing something that's really just after their own evil motives, their own heart, they'll come and they'll cover it with righteous language. Real holy language. A lot of virtue signaling going to look real good, but really deep down inside, it is evil that's going on in their hearts. And again, let me press in. If we're not careful, we can do the same thing. We can actually have a motive where we're trying to get something. We're trying to get people to like us. We're trying to, to buddy up next to them. And, and, and really our motive isn't good, but we, we cover it with Christian language, that Christianese we sometimes use. And it isn't really a godly thing. And that's what the, these guys are doing. So again, the first encouragement I do have for you is just be careful. Be careful. Ask God to search your heart. Make sure that you're not doing evil and trying to cover it up with good just to get people to like you. That would be in the same boat as these guys. What's interesting is David does not, just like he hasn't before, he doesn't take these guys. He's not like, yeah, he's not like, yeah, he's celebrating. This isn't how he wants the kingdom. He doesn't want people to be murdered, especially the king of Israel that time, even though he's the rightful king. He doesn't want them to be murdered. But notice how David responds when they come. He's tempted at this point. This could make him, quote unquote, stronger, perhaps. This could bless him. But look how he responds in verse 9. When those guys came and they say all this, David answered them, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. David has a thankful heart. He focuses on what God has done for him. And he is thankful. And so let me encourage you with this. When tempted... When tempted to, 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 to go away from God's plan. Maybe something else that looks good or it might benefit you, especially when I'm thinking about this thing long term. Let me encourage you, don't go away from God's goodness. And the way you fight that is you're thankful. You fight that stuff with thankfulness. You look back and you say, no, no, no. The Lord has redeemed me. He has delivered me from every enemy, including myself, Devil and death. He's redeemed me. I'm not going to move on this thing. That's how David responds. Let me also encourage you with this. David is the anointed king. And these guys come. And we were singing about this over and over and over again. They come. And what they did. Would you say what they did was just or unjust? Injust, right? It wasn't good what they did. They were murdering the king. The way David responds as the true king, here's what he's saying. This kingdom is a kingdom of justice. That's why they got what they deserved. What David ended up doing to them is actually from the book of Deuteronomy. If you murder somebody like that, you're to be hung on a tree. You're cursed and you're put on a tree. And in Genesis 9, where Noah, when God's talking to Noah, here's what he says to Noah. If anyone, whether it be an animal or a person, kills somebody, 
that person or that animal, their life must be taken. Now that's to Noah, which goes to all of mankind. That's not a promise or a covenant just with the nation of Israel. That was to Noah and all of mankind. And you might say this, well, how can God think so little of people that he just, he just lets them you know, be killed? No, 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 no. It's the opposite. Human life is so precious, made in the image of God, that if you take a human life, or an animal does, it's put to death. That's how serious it is. So what David's doing is he's actually just following what has already been written in the Bible. And so what we see is the kingdom of David, not the one of Saul, but the kingdom of David will have justice. It will have justice. And as we were seeing about that, how does this, how does this connect to Jesus' kingdom? Once we know Jesus is going to come from David's line, but, but David is a shadow of the kingdom that's to come. And we're seeing about it all morning about God's justice. But the problem is, if God is holy, which He is, amen? amen? And if He's just, then sin must be punished. It must happen. He's holy. He is good. He can't let things go. How many of you have had things happen in your life where you're like, oh man, that person got away with it. They got away with it. Guess what? In David's kingdom as of right now, but certainly in Jesus' kingdom, nobody gets away with anything. Everyone will pay their dues. The scary thing is, if, if it's justice, we're all in trouble. If we get what we deserve, if God is fair, then all we get is death and condemnation. And that's the beautiful thing about what we were singing He's hung on a tree. Jesus is hung on a tree. Those guys, they were cursed and put on a tree. The same thing is said about Jesus. The difference? Those guys have done something wrong. Jesus and the tree he goes on? Did he do anything wrong? Not a thing. Who did? We did. They go to the tree and are cursed because of their sin. Jesus goes to the tree and is cursed because of our sin. So that... God's justice would be seen and God would remain holy and right and good and yet mercy would be shown as well. Mercy would be shown. How can sinners be saved from a holy God? There has to be, as we read in Hebrews, a shedding of blood. There has to be a sacrifice. If not, then everyone gets away with it. Everyone gets away with it. Then God is not holy. There has to be something that's done. There has to be a shedding of blood. And an animal won't do. It has to be human blood. It has to be perfect blood. A sinless sacrifice. We see that throughout the whole Old Testament. How is it a sinless sacrifice? That's where Jesus comes in. Born of the virgin, right? Not born like the rest of us with a sinful nature. Lives that perfect life. Obeys the law completely. And he dies on that cross as that sacrifice. Cursed on a tree for us. But as we celebrated last Sunday, and we celebrate every Sunday, he didn't stay dead because he's the perfect sinless sacrifice. Three days later, he rises. And boom, you see mercy. It's God's holiness and justice poured out at the cross. And three days later, he rises in the, the mercy of God. Mercy is this. Hey, you don't get what you deserve. We, we deserve death. We deserve hell. We don't get that. That's mercy. But it doesn't stop there. We also read in Ephesians. We also talked about grace. You know what grace is? Mercy is you, you don't get what you deserve, right? You deserve this. Grace is, oh, you're getting things you don't deserve. God's grace. Not only does he forgive us, he brings us into his kingdom as sons and daughters. And some of you are like, ah, I don't have a good father or mother. I don't like that language. You don't have the perfect father or mother, the heavenly father. You're adopted in by his grace. And that's the kingdom. So when we look at this passage, we go, oh man, so much death, so much evil. Yeah, that's the point. That's the point of the cross. That's the point of the empty tomb. It's to save us. And even though these men were cursed and died on a tree, the one who cursed was cursed and died for us rises to be the king better than David. To sit on his throne and rule with justice, mercy, 
and grace for all who would believe. I pray that to you today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. We're thankful that Jesus was hung on a tree for us. We're thankful that he rose three days later. We're thankful that we see on that cross your justice and your mercy come together and truly kiss one another at the cross. Lord, help us to be people who who aren't those who are seeking to be thought well of and willing to do underhanded things or dishonest things just to have power or fame or popularity or anything else. Help us to be like David in this text. Help us to be a thankful people who are so thankful for your kindness and your mercy and your justice and all that you have done for us, Lord, that you you just remind us of this and work in us in such a way that we would fight against those temptations by Your Spirit. God, I pray for those who are here who do not know You, Lord. I pray that today they would cry out to this King, trusting in His death and resurrection because they see today that their their works aren't going to cut it. They need mercy and they need grace. Lord, we all need it. Remind us of it in Jesus' name. Amen.